Hello everyone. It's that time of year where we're all just finished up with our family time, our holiday time, spending time with all the ones that we love. Perhaps look at a New Year's resolutions, etc. Also, something else that's in the back of our minds because the T word starts to pop up about this time of year and that's taxes. Like I said, every year when it comes to tax planning, so many of us do what we call rear view mirror planning. We always see what's happening in the past. One of the things I'm always encouraging you and everyone is that tax planning needs to be looked at into the future. We often say that taxes may be your number one expense in retirement. So I want to take a few minutes of your time and talk about five year-end tax strategies that we can look at here in the beginning of the year. Maybe some things that you haven't thought about. We're also going to talk about a few changes in the rules from the Biden administration. I have some notes here to share with you, so let's get started. So first thing, let's talk about gifting. Around this time of year, we often start thinking about gifting. For this strategy, number one is gifting appreciated stock. What we're doing here is avoiding any long-term capital gain or tax liability. When you do that, though, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. If you're gifting an appreciated stock to a charity, for example, the capital gain will be erased, and they will get the stock at the value it is today. So if they get the stock worth $100 when you bought it, and now it's worth $200, they're going to get it at $200. However, if you gift an appreciated stock to an individual, you're going to have to understand that the step-up basis will follow them and the capital gains will have to go to them as well. So when they liquidate the stock, they will pay the capital gains. Now, some of the benefits of gifting an appreciated stock is, assuming you itemize, you'll receive a charitable deduction for the value of the stock. And of course, you're going to avoid capital gains on the growth of the stock. Also, keep in mind with everything that we're going to talk about today, please, Make sure and run this by your tax advisor, CPA, anybody who helps you with understanding taxation, and of course, with your own personal advisor. We'll talk about all these issues as we go along. At the end of the year, we get a lot of clients that say they want to give things to their churches, charitable organizations, things like that. And we look at qualified charitable distribution. This is an option for an individual to take a distribution from their retirement account. This distribution goes directly to a qualified charitable organization of their choosing. Typically, when we see this, this is when people start taking their required minimum distributions. Say, for example, you have a RMD of $10,000. What that did was increase your taxes, correct? You think, maybe I don't need all this money. It's already going to be taxed, so how can I get around that? Well, qualified charitable distributions will help you do that because what it will do is, say you have $20,000 distribution that's due, and you only need $10,000 of that. You could send directly from your IRA to your charitable organization the $10,000 tax-free, and it will be a deduction to you. However, it still satisfies your required minimum distribution. The only thing that's ever going to go on your 1099 is the other $10,000 that you're going to use. So again, while fighting over distributions, it's a great planning tool, and it's something that you're really going to want to target to myself, to your CPA, and anybody else in your tax world, your advisors. Okay, strategy number two, Roth conversions. Those of you that know me, I hit on this really hard. Let me tell you, the sunset laws in our current tax environment are coming to an end in 2026. So we're entering 2022. Now we have the next four or five years to actually get this done in our current tax environment. Folks, we are at the absolute lowest tax rate that you'll ever see. And you hear this, all the stuff about the money we owe and the debt that's being created. It's already been spoken about that taxes must rise. So. Now is the time to really look and have a really good conversation with your advisor and your tax advisor on how to start converting from a taxable environment into a non-taxable environment. These are some of the things that you need to consider. First of all, considering your length until retirement or if you're already retired, how many years you're planning to be in retirement. Your current standard deduction is important because we need to understand where you're at and we need to understand the tax bracket capacity. We want to make sure that when we're converting that we're not causing excess taxation. We're not talking about tax evasion, we're talking about tax efficient planning. Then what's important to look at is so many people do not look at that is the projected growth inside of your IRA account. We need to look into the future and kind of get an idea as to where this might go so we can make educated decisions. But again, these are the things that you need to discuss with your advisor and your tax advisor. Okay. Let's move on to tax harvesting. This is an interesting concept because with tax harvesting, what we're doing here is we're selling the securities at a loss to offset capital gains. This strategy typically is employed to limit the recognition of short-term capital gains and movement and generally taxed at a higher income tax rate. That's why we do it. So remember, short-term capital gains and anything that happens within a 12-month period become ordinary income. When we do tax harvesting, we're selling securities at a loss to offset those short-term capital gains. Again, this is something that you really want to talk to your tax planner and, of course, with me. 
your advisor so that we can really get a good understanding as to what the possibilities are here. The benefit of this, of course, is to generate tax savings in places that can often be overlooked. Because of wait till the very end to do some of these things and we're not proactive, this is something that gets lost as we move along in our tax planning. Now, let's talk about distribution planning and what's going on with distributions. Distribution really comes down to what types of accounts you have in place and how much money you need to pull from all these accounts. So, let's look at this. The SECURE Act changed a few things when it comes to one of the fourth distributions that you're going to have to have, which is minimum distribution. It pushed the starting age from 70 and a half out to age 72. So before we used to have start taking required minimum distributions at age 70 and a half. Now it's moved to age 72. And remember, in 2021, you must take required minimum distributions if you're over 72. Now, let's talk about RMD aggregation rules because this is an area too that has a lot of confusion. What can be commingled, where you can take money from, and things like that is what we're going to cover. So let's look at this when it comes to aggregation, when it comes to distribution of qualified plans. When I say qualified plans, I'm talking about your IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, thrift savings plans, SEPs, or 457 plans. These are the types of things we're talking about right now. Okay, and the IRS is very, very clear on what you can commingle and what you have to take out separately. Okay, what I mean by this, if you have an RMD, required minimum distribution, the IRS says that you move money still inside of a 401k, 457, or 403b, you must take the required minimum distribution from each and every one of those things separately. So if you have $100,000 in a 401k and another $100,000 in a 403b, you have $200,000. You have to take the RMD from the 401k and take the RMD from the 403b separately. You cannot commingle those funds. If you do that, it'll cause a 50% tax penalty. It is critical that we understand that. This is one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about telling each and every one of you that you must start thinking about moving some of these assets from these company-sponsored plans to your own self-directed IRAs. Because if you have everything under an IRA umbrella, the government does not care where you take the money from. You can have $10,000 in your IRA and you can commingle all that from anywhere you want to. Again, this is probably the biggest gotcha that the IRS has and the biggest penalty you will pay, which again is a 50% tax penalty. Now, also, let's not forget about in-service distributions. Sometimes, you know, the rules for a lot of places is that unless you're 59 and a half or you've been separated or fired or retired, you can't touch your qualified company-sponsored plan. But that's not quite true. Many, many companies out there today allow you to do what's called an in-service non-hardship distribution, which means that prior to separation or prior to age 59 and a half or most plans immediately after 59 and a half that you're able to go into your 401ks and 403bs and thrift savings plans and move those over to your own IRA so you can start taking control of it. All of your possible options that are available to you and take over distributions and how you're going to distribute and keep those away from all those other gotchas. Okay, tax strategy number five, net unrealized appreciation. This is something that goes unnoticed for a lot of people. When it comes to appreciation, we have an individual that buys a company stock. So say you work for Ford and your 401k, you buy Ford stock. You may have other monies that you have in your mutual funds and things like that, but you have a substantial amount of Ford stock. Okay, now the IRS offers a provision that allows for a more favorable capital gains tax rate on that stock. So basically what the net unrealized appreciation is, this is the difference between the original cost basis and the current value of the shares. So what needs to happen is a couple of things here. If you're thinking about doing an NUA, you must understand that everything must be transferred in kind to a non-qualified account. So those stocks will move from your 401k into your own brokerage account, okay? You will pay on the original cost basis. You'll pay regular income tax. So let's say you bought that stock for $10, the Ford stock, and now it's worth $30. You will pay regular income tax, ordinary income tax on the $10. The remainder of that stock, when it's sold out, will be a capital gain. So that's where if you're in a higher tax bracket, are you gonna to continue to go up the tax ladder? It's so important to look at this. Okay, now, under the NUA rules, you can elect to defer taxes in, on the NUA until the time that you liquidate the stock. Okay, so once you liquidate the stock, you've already paid the cost basis, and when you look at the stock, when you sell the stock, you'll pay capital gains. Now, the remainder of the account, so everything else that's left in the 401k, you know all the mutual funds and everything else must be rolled over into an IRA after a qualifying event which means after separation. Anything after death, all these monies must be moved into an IRA. They cannot stay in the qualified plan, okay? 
So again, this is why it's so important that you speak to your tax advisor, to your regular advisor, and together make sure that this is really going to be in your best interest. So I told you about five strategies, but I'm throwing a couple extras in here, okay? Let's talk about itemized deductions and bundling of deductions. A huge majority of all the tax returns nowadays are done on a short form because the itemized deductions are so huge. As a matter of fact, if you're married filing jointly, that's going to be $25,900. If you're single or married filing separately, that amount is $12,950 this year. And if you're age 65 and over and married, you're going to get an additional $1,350. If you're not married, an additional $1,700. It's always going to take a lot for you to take advantage of any chance of doing itemized deductions. But one of the things that your advisor or your tax planning advisor would suggest is bundling these deductions so you can start itemizing again. And some of that means like prepaying taxes or prepaying things that you would ordinarily pay out on a, on a monthly basis. But what you do is maybe one year you're going to do the short form and one year you'll do a long form. Just trying to take advantage of all of the things we can do. Because what you're doing here is you're taking these extra things that you're paying, you're putting them together all at the same time, being able to bundle those and take advantage of itemized deductions. So again, these are things that you're going to want to talk to your advisor and your tax planner to see if this is going to benefit you. We talked about this at the end of the year, but all of this is that you need to start planning for 2022. Looking at this and what you can bundle, what you can prepay and things like that. Another thing is the state of local taxes this year. SALT has increased from $10,000 to $80,000. This is happening in 2022. The other big one is that non-cash donations over $5,000 must be appraised. So if you're going to donate your car to Precious Child or any other type of charitable organization, they can no longer appraise the car. It must be done by an independent appraiser. This is very, very important this year so that you know that. Again, you're going to donate a car, you're going to donate your boat, anything that has a value of over $5,000 must be appraised by an outside source, not the charity that's receiving it. Really, really important here. Let's talk a little bit about the Biden tax law that's been enacted here. Although there's so many things in there, we're just going to talk quickly about some of the things that popped up that I thought would be important to share with you. One of the big ones that we thought the we thought capital gains were going to go going to raise, but capital gains at this point will remain at 20% as a maximum. The other thing they talked about was the top tax bracket and maybe going to move to 39% plus. That will stay at 37% as of right now, the filming of this. And there's one that's really interesting with changes in retirement plans. Roth conversions in excess of $650,000 will not be available, but this won't go into effect until 2031. So in essence, what they're telling you right now is, hey, you've got about 10 years to make sure that you get your act together and move from all this taxable stuff over into a tax-free environment. Again, this is why you really need to talk about Roth conversions. It is super, super important. I can't tell you how many people say to me, I wish I'd have known about this before. Don't let that person be you. Last but not least for you small business owners out there that still own a business, if you're an S corporation, you're going to be subject to stuff like this. S corporation's net income will be subject to the 3.8% net investment tax, which is I call, I, I like to call it the cockroach tax. The God dog thing has been around here since the Obama era when he did the Obama tax plan. Every year it's on the books to get it taken off. but. You know what they say about roaches. The only thing that kills them is a nuclear bomb. So this thing has been around forever, and it looks like it's going to stay around. And now it looks like it's going to infest small businesses as well. So, folks, I want to make this kind of brief. I went through that pretty quickly. But I want you to start thinking, because I know now that we're in 2022, once we got through the hustle and bustle of the holidays, all this stuff, it's going to be, this stuff's going to be on your mind. The thing to do now is to start acting. Be proactive, not reactive. It's time to start scheduling a time for you and I to speak so that if we need to speak with your tax advisor, we have the time ahead of time. Also, it's time to do some forward planning. I can't stress enough about forward tax planning. We need to get out of the habit of rear, end, rear view tax planning because, again, last year already happened. We need to prepare for the next. Some of these things that I shared with you today will help you for last year, but a lot of this is going to get you ready for the 2022 tax year. Because you can see the taxation is going to be an issue here and you want to be in control. So I look forward to speaking with you in the very near future. I'm going over some of these things to see what's out there to benefit you. I can tell you 2022 is going to be a very, very interesting year. Not just for taxes, but of course what's happening in our economy. There's three huge things that are happening right now that we're looking at for the first quarter that I think are really going to shake up the markets. 
First one being that the inflation is rearing its ugly head. It's here and it's coming in fiercely. Number two is that the government now is removing all that juice from the markets. All those trillions of dollars that they were using to prop up this market is coming to an end and coming to an end soon. At the same time, we got the GDP deceleration. And we have the forecast of what's happening with corporate earnings coming in the first quarter because of the shipping issues and because of everything else that we've had going on, including COVID. There's so much going on and now is the time for you to act because when you act, you're in control. When you react, you're not. Here's to a wonderful and prosperous new year. Let's get together and talk. Click on that calendar link and we'll have a time. Thanks.